Okay. So um, we are getting close to the end now. So this lecture is going to do the rotor examples. Next lecture, we're just going to have a, a revision lecture of the whole course. Okay, so that'll be a summary of what we've done. And then a review of some uh, exam questions from a, a recent exam paper. And then I'm, I'm not proposing to do any more lectures after that, okay? So Monday and Wednesday this week will be the last ones. The tutorial sessions on Friday are going to carry on right through until week 12, okay? So if you've got any queries or any problems or anything you want to discuss, then that's the best place to come to in the first instance, okay? So we've been through, in the last couple of lectures, we've been through um, some rotor examples. Uh, particularly gyroscopes and balancing. Okay, so I'm going to try and go through some examples relating to those two topics now. Okay, so that's that's the purpose of this lecture. So, um, and these should be in the uh, the downloadable lecture slides. In fact, when I went through this uh, this morning, I noticed some errors, so I've actually updated it. So the the if you've downloaded it. Uh, before today, you might want to download the, the most recent version. So when we did the, um, the balancing lecture, I mentioned to you that the way to solve these problems was to tabulate uh, the problem. And so that's, what, that's the example we're going to show today. So the typical scenario is that you get something like this shown up there, that you've got uh, two bearings, A and B, with a shaft in between, and then you've got these um, out-of-balance masses, which are represented by a lumped mass at some offset, uh, some distance R from the shaft, okay? And so they're assumed to be rotating in a plane, okay? And the out-of-balance mass has not only a distance from the shaft, but it has an angle as well, okay? So you've got to imagine that what these out-of-balance masses are, ro are representing are rotating disks normally. Okay, so we've simplified the rotating disk into uh, an out-of-balance mass, which is some distance from the center at some angle as well. Okay, so in this case, you can see the table below is actually got, uh, the first column is saying plane. Okay, so there's actually four planes. So what we're considering is that there's a plane at, at A where the first bearing is, and then a plane at the first mass where M1 is, then a plane at second mass M2, and then a finally an, a fourth plane at the bearing mass B. Sorry, there's no mass there, a bearing B. Okay, so when you fill in these these tables, that's that's the way to do it. Put the you know look at the shaft. Divide it up into the key points on the shaft which have to have some entry into the table. So that's basically anywhere where anything's happening. Okay? But do it in sequence as well. Okay? So there's like a logical sequence. So then you can see that the next line is the mass. Okay? So at the, at the bearings, A and B, there is no mass. Okay? So there's just like a dash to show that there's no entry. Obviously, for the other two planes, there are masses. Okay? So they're, they're put into the table. Same with the radius or the distance from the shaft to the out of balance mass. There isn't any A and B, so just like a, a dash, but there are values elsewhere. Now, the, the next column says distance from B. Okay. Now, in an exam type scenario, it wouldn't, wouldn't tell you that. Okay. You may have to make a decision. Okay. The reason this says distance from B is because we're going to take moments around the point B. Okay. So there's zero. Uh, point B, that's the distance D. Um, but the other ones have uh, values, of course. Okay, and we're going to use that for the moment calculation or the dynamic part of the balancing. So normally you would have to define this. Okay, so you would have to choose which point are you going to take moments about, and therefore, what does that column say? It might it might be that you do, you take moments about A, and in fact, for these types of shaft problems where you're asked to look at the uh, uh, loading on bearings, you can take it about A or B. It doesn't make any difference. Okay, if you've got a different a different type of problem where you're asked to find out um, a missing mass in one of the planes in between the shaft bearings, then it, usually you take moments about that plane 
Okay, because initially you've got very little information about that plane, you take moments there, and it means that allows you to set zero in that column, and then that simplifies the, the uh, solution. Because if you, if you skip along a couple of columns, if you, if you skip along to the end column, what you see is because we've got zero in distance from B, when we multiply by D in the last column, that also makes the bottom entry zero. Okay, so if you're trying to find something at a plane, take moments about the plane because it makes that, that first entry in the MRD column zero. Okay, and then that simplifies the problem for you. Okay, everywhere else, uh, we've got, if we've got question marks, that means there's something we've got to find. If we've got um, values, then we can work out what those numbers are from the information we've got already. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of setup for these types of problems. So just going through the example that's in the notes. So this one says you've got a shaft rotating at 3,000 RPM and uh, it asks you to find the loads on the bearings A and B. Okay, so there's three, and in between A and B now there's three different out of balance masses. And it gives you the numerical values now. So this is more like an exam question where you've got actual values and you've got to um, crunch the numbers and work out what they are. Okay, so let's go through step by step. So first thing is to write out the table that we're going to fill in. Okay, and so we've done the same thing. We've got, we've written down plane as our first column, starting at bearing A. Then we've got one, two, and three where we've got out of balance masses and we finish in, in uh, bearing B. So, obviously, we've been given the masses in the question, so we can just write them in straight away. We've been given the radiuses in the question, so you just write those in as well. Clearly, we've taken the, the uh, decision here to take moments about B, so we've worked out all of our distances from, from that. But if you look at the question, it doesn't say take moments about B, or anything like that. So, you, you know, you, you've got to make that decision. And as I say, for a bearing question, you could do it about B or about A. It doesn't make a difference. And then we've also got the angle uh, information in degrees. Okay, so we put that into the table as well. So now we've got to... So that's all the kind of basic, the basic stuff. We've got to then start working out these quantities for the static and dynamic balance. So the first column, M times R, is the static balance, and the second column is MRD, is the dynamic balance. Well, as we've been given those MR values, initially we can work, we can just calculate those straight away, can't we? And we can, we can calculate the MRD values that we've got as well. But what it leaves us is with some missing values, okay? So you can see now we've got three question marks there, okay? And we've got to solve and find them. Now, because in the MRD column, we've only got one question mark, it's simplest to start there, okay? So if we start there, we've got one unknown to find. If you look at the MR column, we've actually got two unknowns at the, each bearing, okay? So actually, we can't solve that straight away. We need to go to the MRD one first, and solve there to start with. And what you're actually doing when you solve this, if you remember from what we did in the lecture, we did this sum of the, of the components, the MRD components, we're trying to make them equal zero. Okay, well, you can represent that as a vector sum. Okay, so if we start with the ones that we've already got, okay, so these, the, the top two are blank because they've got the unknown in it, okay? Okay, if we start with the ones we've, we know about, so we know that there's this vector with a magnitude of 35 at angle 20 degrees, okay, and then we've got one that's size 25 at 80 degrees, another one at 120 uh, with a magnitude of 4. Okay, so the thing that's missing is this vector to close the loop. To make this zero, okay, we need a vector that looks like this. Okay, and if we work out, in a minute we're going to work out these numbers, but if we work out what these numbers are, then these are the numbers. Now, there's a reason for showing you this, okay, which you'll see in a minute, is because when we start doing the, 
the calculation, the analytical calculation, there comes a point where it becomes crucial to know how big this angle is, okay? And that's because of the arctan. We, we have to do an arctan to find the angle, okay? An arctan only finds the primary value, doesn't it, between plus or minus 90, and you can add on as many 180s as you like, okay? And it's still the arctan, okay? The arctan is a function with multiple solutions. Okay, so it's useful to know what this, what this angle is, roughly, okay? So if you sketch that out, because you've got all this information, then you'll have some idea of what, what you're looking for. Okay, so to solve this thing, what you do is you take the vertical and horizontal components, okay, and you can write them down like this. So what we've done is we're just taking the, all of the different components, so that's the magnitudes times the cosines of their respective angles, okay, adding them all together, and then we've got this missing component here, okay, MRD times cosine of the missing angle, okay, and from that you can work out what this, uh, what this missing thing is, the complete thing. You can do this in the horizontal and vertical directions, okay, and so therefore you can work out what the tan of the angle is if you divide these two things, you get the tan, uh, the magnitude divides out, and then from that you get this expression here, okay, which is a number. So if somebody puts the, put the, put these numbers into their calculator and do arctan, what do you get out? So you can do it. Has anyone worked it out? What do you get? 48, something like 48, yeah? So you don't get, you don't get this angle here. And that's because you need to add, add 180 on. To get, the, to get the correct angle. Because like I say, when you do the arctan, it just gives you the, a calculator just gives you the primary value, doesn't it? Which is the value, the smallest value in between plus or minus 90. So any angle that's bigger than 90, okay, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get that, uh, th that value. Okay, so that's why having sketched out with the vectors, we know that we're looking for an angle around this amount Okay, so if we work out what this arctan is, we should be able to work out how many 180s we need. Well, you'll only have to add on one to get the correct angle. Once you've got this angle, you can go back and use one of these expressions. Okay, you can use what this expression, for example, to work out what the MR times D value is. Okay, and that turns out in this case to be 53.34. Okay, so then you can plug that back into our overall table. So now, now our table looks like this. Okay, so what we've done is we've worked out two extra pieces of information. We've now got this piece of information here, and we've also got this angle here as well. Okay, so that's, that's what we've done there. What we're missing is this one where there should be a question mark and this, these here as well. Okay, so we've... We've now, because we've, uh, okay, so we've got D, so we can work out what MR is, haven't we? Because we know this is D, and we know this, this is MRD, we can now work out what MR is here. Okay, so now in this column, this is the static balance column, we've got this missing uh, element, and we've got this missing angle. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve the static balance Okay, so again, like we did before, now we've got, this is all our information. So now if we, if we write a vector diagram, but this time we're going to use the magnitudes of the, of the M times R, and we're starting from where we started before, okay, for, from this line here. So 20 degrees, magnitude 10, 80 degrees, magnitude 12.5, 120, magnitude 4, okay. 
sorry, this, is go, this then goes back up. This is 120 magnitude 4. Then it, next line is 229.11.85. So then we know we're looking for something like this, an angle like this, roughly 260. OK, so to solve that analytically, we do the same things we did before. But this time, we're doing the MR values, not the MRD values. OK, so this is the sum of MRs in the horizontal and vertical directions. So you take each one, multiply by the cos of its, for the first one, for horizontal, cos of its angle all the way through. OK, and then we have one missing component here. Same with the vertical. So we go through with all of these, and this is the sine of the angles now and the missing component. So we get another numerical value here. So we do the arctan again. And again, we have to correct for the fact that arctan has these multiple values by adding on 180 to get this 260 degrees. OK? Take it and plug it back into this expression. And then we'll get the MR at A value, which is 10.41. OK, so, and we've got now all of the elements in the table. <clears throat> so our table is now complete, isn't it? OK, so we've got the 10.4 in here and the angle 260. OK, so we've, we've got nothing else to complete in this table now. So to get the bearing loads, because if you remember what the question actually asked was find the bearing loads. So again, in the lecture, we had this expression. OK, so we crunch out some numbers. We know that the uh, angular velocity omega is 3,000 RPM. So we convert that to radians per second. OK, and then we take the MR value out of the table. And we have uh, omega squared. So for A, we can get. Uh, we can get a value 1124 kilonewtons. And we know that the angle that is acting is the same as the angle in the table. So that's 229 degrees. OK, and to do the same for uh, the force at B. OK, so you take the value out of the table, m times r, which is 10.4 in this case, times it by omega squared. You get, get what the force is, and you get the angle, which is the angle out of the table. OK, so you're all going to be good at doing those now. So that's um, the bearing example. Has anyone got any questions on that one? The way to do it is to just practice one. Like if you go through a tutorial sheet or past paper where they've got one in, um, you'll, you'll, I think you'll find there's a kind of logic to how it works. Quite often, in some questions, you're given a partially completed table okay, to fill in. Other times, you're not given any table at all, so you have to write your own table and so on. But it's pretty easy to recognize when you're being asked to do this kind of balancing type of problem. Okay? And that's the, tab the table is the way to, go to, to, uh, to get it right. So. This is a gyroscope example. Again, this is in the, it's in the notes. Um, and this is actually a little bit of an unusual example, but um, let's go through it anyway, because it, it gives us something to, uh, to talk about. So what's the setup in this one is that there's a, a disk. OK, so this gray thing is a disk that can rotate on a pivot underneath it. OK, so, and it says that it's rotating at certain um, revolutions per minute. And then on that disk is a motor. And the motor is rotating or spinning around an axis here. It's got two supports. OK, and it gives you some dimensions in millimeters. Well, it doesn't actually say millimeters, but that's what they are. They're millimeters. And it gives you an RPM of the rotation of the motor. OK, it tells you it's got a mass of 10 kilograms and it's supported by brackets. Um, it says uh, the armature's got 2.5 kilograms, radius of gyration of 35, 
millimeters and it wants you to find the vertical components of the support uh, of the force supported by the mounting brackets a and b okay so it's it's trying to get you to work out first of all you obviously rec have to recognize this as a gyroscope problem and then it wants you to find out what the um, supporting uh, reaction forces are for the for the brackets so So first thing is to do is to find the gyroscopic moment. Okay, so we work out the, the moment of inertia first from the information we've got given in the, in the uh, question. Okay, so uh, this is mk squared. You get a value here. And again, we need to take this, the velocities that are given in RPMs or whichever format they're given and uh, convert them to radians per second. So this is the, uh, the spin angular velocity, small omega. Okay, so that's the rotation of the motor itself. And then this is the precession velocity, large omega. Okay, so we're just doing a bit of housekeeping to convert those into the right units before we can work out what the gyroscopic moment is. So once we've done that, we can use the scalar equation if we want. Okay, so this is all, everything's scalar quantities here. So we can just work out using this that the moment is 2.78 newton meters. Okay, by multiplying the moment of inertia by large omega and by small omega. Okay, so we also got to work out the, the direction of the gyroscopic, of gyroscopic moment. Okay, so one advantage if you do if you do this using the vector equation, okay, then it tells you the sign of the moment tells you which way it's it's operating. Okay, so one advantage of using the vector algebra in this case is that the direction comes out automatically in terms of the sign of the moment that you get. Um, so, otherwise, if you want to, uh, if you've got the scalar, if you've got the scalar equation, then you have to think back to what's happening in terms of the rotation and the direction. Okay, so this is a um, a way of doing that. Okay, so thinking about what's going on. This is the actual motor rotating here, and so this is the this is the moment actually in vector form acting in this direction, okay, these are our axes that we're assuming here, the i and k and j upwards, because this is the processional motion happening around this j-axis. So, the gyroscopic moment acts on the rotor uh, and there's a there's a reaction force uh, sorry there's a reaction moment to that okay so we have a so this is trying to show you that there's two two things happening here one is the moment from the gyroscopic effect one is the reaction to that that moment and then the final part of this this question is to um, use a little bit of free body diagram uh, type of analysis just to work out what the reaction forces are and I think in playing around with that so there's so to do that you take the the force balance in the vertical direction and then take the moment equilibrium balance as well I think to, I've been messing around with this today and I've put 2.5 in here when it should be 10 okay I've just noticed that um, I haven't done that right so I'll change it and update it on the on the on the lecture slides so if you do that then you can uh, you can come out with some solutions for the uh, the reaction forces you look enthralled so that's all I wanted to do today actually so I've got those two examples we've got our uh, revision lecture on Wednesday and we've got tutorials on Friday um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Otherwise, I shall see you all Wednesday.